Good morning, Erlanger. Good to see you today. We're going to start our service singing to God be the glory, great things he's done. I invite you to stand as we sing. To God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who viewed in His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice The Son through the Father Through Jesus the Son And give taught us great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure and higher and greater will be. We live in a loud world. The news bombards us on every side with stories of tragedy, sickness, crime, and struggle. Social media shows us perfect pictures of perfect people living perfect lives, leaving us obsessed with likes, streaks, and follows. It's exhausting. Commercials overwhelm us with materialism, keeping us wanting more and stealing our contentment. In the midst of many voices telling us what we need to be happy, scripture whispers one simple truth. True happiness comes from hearing and obeying God's voice. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. God is speaking to us. He's not just interested in a one-way conversation. He's inviting us to respond to His call. So are you ready to really listen to the voice that matters? Because that's what Frequency is all about. Good morning, everyone. Are you glad to be here? Did you know it's raining outside? We need rain. Rain is a good thing. But we don't need it in here, which is, it's not. Which means we are free to not have to worry about that. We are a blessed people. We get to come into a place. It is comfortable. It is protected. And we get to come in and we get to sing about to God be the glory. I just want to stop and just ask you that question. Um, does God get the glory in your life? We sing that he deserves it. And so this morning as you participate, I want to encourage you that you're participating in lifting up who this God is. Reminding ourselves that we have come into this place because of who that God is, because of his blessings over us, all the things that we often take for granted, right? We have grass that needs to be watered and trees that need to be taken care of, and yet he takes care of all of those things for us, providing rain. 
providing an opportunity every week for us to come into this place to worship because so many times we get our minds and our hearts torn by other things and distracted by other things. And so he says, don't give up the routine of meeting together because you need to be here to be reminded that you're my people and that I have a plan and a purpose for you and that I have a a mission that I've called you to participate in and a blessing to pour over you. And so I pray that that's what happens this morning. We are talking about our fall family or our fall EBC family fall retreat, which was the video you just watched. And that is the, that there's a lot of voices out there. And this weekend in late October, you're going to be challenged in what are you listening to and what perspective are you using in making the decisions that you make, the actions that you take, the words that you speak. And I want to encourage you to participate. I've gone around to some more life groups this morning, just kind of inviting them again to be a part of that weekend. If you want to learn more about that, you are able to do that by going on our website. Today is kind of the soft, uh, it's the deadline um, in that we are going to be putting together orders. Uh, If you know anything about ordering anything, we have to order t-shirts, which takes just a long time to get in to guarantee that we can get them. Um, but we are, we're asking everybody to make sure that you get signed up. And so if you haven't taken the time to do that, would you do that today? Uh, even if you're coming for our, our fall family night today, maybe you could take a moment and uh, sign up while you're there at that event. It just takes some time to make sure that you get you and your family signed up. There's something for every age group. There's brochures. Everything is online. Um, but it is a chance for us to be together as the EBC family It is a chance to unplug maybe from a lot of different things and listen to the voice of God and be reminded that he has got this. Uh, He reigns over all things. Uh, He knows all the things that we face, all the adversities, all the challenges, all the decisions, all the um, craziness of life, and all the blessings. And he knows how to interpret those things because he's given us his word and his counselor, his Holy Spirit, who indwells us to be able to do that. So that's part of that weekend, and we want you there. If you um, are here and you are new, man, we're glad that you are here. Uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Randall to come up and share some other announcements with you. Uh, But we're glad that you're here, and I pray that you're able to worship today as we are gathered in this place to the glory of God. Good morning. Just a couple of announcements to run through. First, I hope you grabbed one of these, uh, EBC Weekly Blast. There's all kinds of things on here, uh, things about Christmas choir that's coming up, which everyone is welcome to participate in. For more information, see Pastor Clyde. But a couple of things to point out, Fall Family Night is still happening. It's not going to stop. We're still going to have it. It's going to be indoors. We need people to be here at 3 o'clock. Am I right on that? 3 o'clock to be here to set up, so 3 p.m., Uh, to be here to set up what you have to set up, and it will be from 4 to 6 p.m. So even if you're not participating in helping put on Fall Family Night, we would still love to see you and your families come out and enjoy an evening with us. Uh, The second thing, uh, men's breakfast is this Saturday at 8 a.m. in the Commons. Uh, So men, make sure to mark your calendars and be a part of that. It has really been a blessing. Uh, Saturday. What? It's the ninth, yes. It's the ninth, uh, but it's still this Saturday uh, in the Commons at 8 a.m. And uh, it has been a blessing if if you're a dude to be there and to be blessed by uh, each month has been someone different that's given a devotion, and each one of them have been great, thought provoking on what it means to love the Lord and be a man, uh, following uh, His Word, leading families, uh, and so all of that is just amazing. Um, and then another one that's just as important, we still need volunteers for WizKids, uh, for our WizKid ministry. And if you want more information about that, you can see Mel Barber, who's right there. She's waving her hand. And Lori Lindemann. So if you feel led to volunteer with WizKids, you can go see them because we are still in need of tutors. So uh, we cannot serve the children who actually are scheduled to be with us unless there's tutors. So we need tutors. And like I said, Pastor BJ said, we're super glad that you're here. If you're a first-time guest, make sure that you get a a guest bag from First Impressions. There's all kinds of information on our church 
uh, necessary that you could ever want to know. And uh, of course, if you're going to give today, you can give in person in our offering plates and our drop boxes, drop boxes on campus, or you can give online at our website at erlingerbaptist.org. Let me pray, and we'll continue in worship this morning. Father, uh, thank you for this morning, for uh, time together in your word, time together in worship, time together gathered as your people. Father, I, um, I would ask that you would remove distractions from this room. Father, it's easy to want to, to wanna feel the urge to, to look down at a text message or an email or to be thinking about who's going to be in the, the college football top 25. It's easy to think about the plans we have after church this afternoon. It's easy to be distracted, just as the video said earlier. Lord, just for the next few minutes, I ask that you would allow us to tune in to your voice to remember your love for us, to honor you in your position as Lord over our lives, Lord over the universe, that you reign and rule, that we would give homage to that. We would give you the praise and worship only you deserve. And so, Lord, help us to lay ourselves down and, and our lives and to tune in for you to speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the freedom that we have to sit in this room, gather to sing your praises, and the freedom to sit and listen to your word. And Lord, your word that goes forth, it doesn't return void. So Lord, whatever you have to accomplish this morning in our hearts and minds with your word, may you accomplish it. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a grand old hymn, Standing on the Promises. I invite you to stand. And the second verse, the ladies will sing. The third verse, the men will sing by themselves. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Ladies Standing on the promises that can of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Ladies, join us. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Good old 
song probably brings back lots of memories and it's fun to sing, but you know what? Many of you have stood on the promises of God and are standing on them right now. That famous Romans 8, 28, we know in all things God works together for the good of those who love him. Some of you have clung to that in the past and some of you are clinging to it even now as you face the future. So the promises of God are not just things we sing and stomp our foot and have a good time with. They're things we actually live out each day, don't they? So it's something to think about. And as we think about what God has done for us, we know the famous John 3:16 verse. Everybody can quote it pretty well. But God loved us. And we see that love displayed on the cross where our Savior took his his very life and laid it down for us. We're going to sing a song, How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his own to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice, call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that brought him there, until it was a his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no Resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart his wounds. I paid my ransom. As you know, today we are um, about to entertain, hopefully, some people in the community coming into our church. We are doing our fall family night. And it's going to have games, it's going to have activities, it's going to have candy, um, it's going to have a puppet show. It's going to have pumpkins, it will have pictures, it will have all that kind of stuff. But it's our hope and our prayer that it's all centered on the gospel. And so they're going to hear the gospel shared. And that's the intent of what we're doing this afternoon, is that people come into this place and they experience the love of Christ through you, the people of God. And they hear the message of Christ through you, who have received that same message and claim it for yourself. And so, yes, it's going to move inside, and so you could think, man, that's not cool because it's not outside. Um, there are some natural detractors that come with not being outside. You're not being seen as people drive by. You can talk about all of those things. And yet there's a God who desires to make himself known. And so we want to take some time in the service right now 
and just pray for every person that's going to come on to this campus. Because it's our prayer that God does spiritual things. That we don't just fill our afternoon and we use our energies and our resources to put on some event. But that instead, people come onto this campus and they get to hear about Jesus Christ. We don't know their circumstances. We don't know the things that they're facing. They may be just trying to hold it together and this gives them a reprieve. They may be looking for a church and God is working on their heart. And he just said, why don't you go to this thing? We don't know their circumstances, but we know the God who does. And so I'm just going to ask Ms. Becky just to kind of play softly. And I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about something that's going on. Maybe, uh, maybe it's someone you need to invite to participate this afternoon. Maybe it's for um, the area in which you're serving, that you would serve in a way that would honor the Lord. And you think, how do I, how do I equate giving out a piece of candy to, to representing Jesus Christ? God, help me to see that, whatever it happens to be. Maybe it's for conversations that you hope to have. Um, I want you just to take a moment. Would you lift up our community and lift up this afternoon? Then I'll close this in a time of prayer. Father, it is called good news for a reason. It's news. It's news to be shared. And so this afternoon, we have the privilege of being your mouthpiece, being your hands and your feet, your voice. We can do that with those that, maybe it's a kid who comes, who hears about your love. It's a different kind of love than the love that they've seen at home school. Maybe it is a parent who is just struggling and needs someone to come alongside of them and let them know that there's a God in heaven who loves them and who wants to take all those circumstances and impress yourself into those things and engage them in those things that they would know you. God, we desire for you to move today to bring people here to hear the gospel, to be loved on. We pray for favor in the eyes of our community today that in offering this opportunity that they would see the love of Christ demonstrated through your people. Lord, this can be a big, intimidating building. And yet what makes it special is not the building, but the people and the Savior whom we claim. And so I pray that that's what they get to experience today. They get to meet you. They get to have fun. They get to run around. But I pray that you would ordain gospel conversations, meaningful conversations where we know that you have gone before us and led us to those moments. And that you give your people the words to speak, the discernment to know how to respond the grace to reach out in hope and love. God, I pray that today would be a day where you are lifted up, not only during this service as we worship, but that because of our personal worship and our corporate worship during this time, that you would be seen and known in our lives, pouring out 
on those to whom we have opportunity to share. God, I thank you for the chance that we have to be the light of the gospel. May we bring forth that joy in the midst of a world that is looking for something. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to just mention real quick before I sit down, that is on Wednesday nights, um, we have been going out into our community. And this past Wednesday night was our last time that we did that. And this Wednesday night, we're going to transition. And I want to invite you and encourage you to participate. We uh, have had a, a prayer meeting on Sunday nights at times. And to uh, take opportunity of Wednesday nights, we're going to actually move that to Wednesday nights. The kids will have something to do. The youth will have something to do. Um, but adults, if you would like to join us for that time, we would love to have you at 6 o'clock. We're going to meet in the fellowship hall. There will be a time of devotion or teaching, but the majority of that time is going to be prayer. So that will start this week. Um, as we just seek the Lord, um, we need to demonstrate that uh, we, we aren't the ones in control and that we as Christians uh, will claim that when we get to our bottom pit and we cry out and too often um, we'll come to the Lord in salvation and then we'll think, I've got it from here, Lord. And yet it's an ongoing dependence upon him. And so everyone is invited. And I would love to see just as many people for a prayer meeting as I see on Sunday morning. And so would you, if you have the ability to be there, would you join us beginning this Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, for times of prayer?
goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. It's his goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. It's his goodness and mercy and the power of his blood. Great reminder, is it not? I hope that that is your testimony as well, that uh, you recognize that it is only because of Christ. Um, I think that's why uh, Paul, when he writes, uh, he just says, I'm compelled by the love of Christ, because he of all people knows um, and constantly reminds his readers of the grace that he has experienced. And as a result, it just drives everything that he does. Well, if you have your Bibles, we are looking at the book of Philippians. We have made it to chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first 11 verses of chapter 2. Philippians is a story and picture of joy. And so that's the kind of the lens through which we have been looking at this book, seeing how this message is being proclaimed, seeing how Paul is sharing, even through his adversity, right? Even being in jail, facing the things that he is facing, yet the context and the feel of this book is one of optimism, one of joy, one of satisfaction in Christ, and one in pursuit of Christ, And so he has kind of shared what's going on in his life, that he is in prison, but that that is a, it's an okay thing because of what he sees God doing. And then he has turned his attention this past week at the end of chapter one to their lives, conducting their lives in the midst of their culture and their community in a way that represented not just a citizen of Rome, a good upstanding citizen of Rome, but that of Christ himself. We have to read that verse, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it was a reminder to us that as Paul sets before uh, them, his readers, himself as an example, that we too have that example set before us to say, okay, what does it look like for us to face life's adversities and to do that with with the optimism that says, God, because of these things, I get to Fill in the blank. Talk about Jesus. See my faith walk grow deeper. You fill in that blank as the things that you have faced in your life have provided those moments, whether it was stepping out in faith or falling on your knees in faith, that he is in control. And so this morning, now we're going to turn our attention to a passage that may be very familiar to you when you hear it. It is one of those passages that talk about just Jesus and just it's kind of almost breaks into a a creed or a hymn, a Christian hymn of proclaiming this Jesus. But in the context of all of that theology is a reason and a rationale for why Paul has put it there. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. So if you have your place, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, we'll read the first 11 verses of chapter 2 together. Hear these words. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, And being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
And for this reason, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that at every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask that as we go this time into your word, that you would move in our hearts and minds. And I thank you for the words that are given us that are still living and active. And God, right now I ask that your spirit would be active with your word. God, we need you to speak. For you to bring challenge and conviction and encouragement. And so I pray that as we sit under your word, that we hear from you this morning. Would you allow us to hear? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see Paul's heart. He is sharing with these people in Philippi a message of joy. And he's heard some things you can kind of glean from the text. And he starts out chapter 2 with these beautiful words. If there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation, if there's any fellowship, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. First thing I want you to see is this. There are a few things that bless a pastor's heart more than unity in the body. And there are a few things that unnerve him more than discord sown among its members. You have here a picture of Paul. And he's reaching out to them and sharing these terms, encouragement, comfort, fellowship, tenderness, compassion. One commentary pointed out that these things relate to the corporate life of the church. This is not the life of an individual. For Paul, life in Christ is life in a Christian community. And believers will have experienced these things in the Christian community because they distinguish it from all other associations. These are the things that point to Jesus. These are the things that bring unity in the body. And Paul is reaching out to these saying, please hear me. He is tipping his hat to say that, hey, there is a conflict. There is maybe some struggle underlying in your faith family. He writes and says that he is asking that his joy would be made complete. So there's some type of acknowledgement that there's an underlying disunity that's threatening the body. In writing this book about joy, here is an equal call for Paul to call them to experience it and fill it themselves. To bring about that unity would be to fill up the joy of the church planter himself. Notice how joy is completed. It is completed with the same mind, the same love, united in spirit with a singular purpose. Notice you can't have a same mind if you only have one of them. Unless you're just really struggling with yourself on a day. The context is certainly community, that you would be of a common mind with others in the community, that you would have a common love that is shared in the community, that you would be united with others in the community. These are things that cannot be done in a vacuum by yourself. These are community activities and expectations that Paul is calling them to. Let me say this, our church has had its fair share of moments where we haven't looked too unified. We've had difficulties, and even now there are, there are groups. Whether we like to kind of admit that or not, there are still things that we need to deal with, and we need to move forward through. And I would say as a pastor, and there's nothing that blesses a pastor more leadership of a church more than to see the people walking in faith, as John would write it, and then also to be in unity in what they 
do and who they are. It's why when you see discord, it does bother us. It's not right. There's something wrong about that. That doesn't mean that there's going to be uniformity. Uniformity would mean that we could really only be me and my church. Because the moment I invite even my wife, who's my best friend, and the person who knows me the best, doesn't necessarily always agree with me. So she couldn't be in my church if it was just about uniformity. But there can be unity. There can be this illustration that Paul is driving at. This isn't a new thing. Discord is not a new thing. He's pointing out this is not something that we should be surprised by. Discord has been around since the garden. I mean, get this. Adam and Eve even hid themselves from their own two-member corporate worship service. They didn't even show up. God was walking in the cool of the garden and they said, we ain't showing up for that service. It's been there ever since. The problem is we know what happens in the next chapter when their kids end up one killing another. Because discord led to murder. Discord is something very dangerous to the body. Disunity is something very dangerous. And Paul is urging them to say, come together for this purpose. He's pointing to a, something a little, a little bit later on in chapter 4. You kind of hear him mention a couple people, even by name, called to live in harmony in the Lord. And so the challenge for every one of us is to say, what does unity look like and how do I play a part in it? What is my role, Lord, in letting Christ be on display in this church? Make my joy complete, is what Paul says. Let this be found in you. The way that he starts this passage is very simply, in our English, we render it with a there is, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any. That's actually not in the Greek. That we have to stick those words in so we can have sentences. But it's really like just mentioning these things. The encouragement in Christ, the, the consolation in love, the fellowship of the Spirit. Because these things are so, make my joy complete because you are to have that in Christ. Notice where it's found. It's found in Christ. It's found in the Spirit. It is not a natural thing for us to do. So how does that look? Well, the second thing I want you to see is this. Unity comes from a willing surrender of personal prominence and prerogative. It is a willing surrender of our personal prominence and prerogative. Verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. How, what are you allowed to do from selfishness? What are you allowed to do from vain conceit? Nothing. That's not, well, I'm allowed to over here, but over here I'll be different. I'll hold on to this or that, and I don't have to surrender that, but over here, okay, I'll, I'll go along with the team. Paul says the way this looks is to do nothing from those things. Nothing of those things are to be um, a part of the Christian experience and community. Now, the Roman culture, we've talked about this before. They, they were driven, promoting a zeal to attain public status, to promote one another's honor. They were to seek out to be the best and to be known as the best. Prominence was an important piece of the Roman culture. This was Philippi. It was a Roman colony, and therefore it had the pride of being a part of Rome. And so with that came the kind of the, yeah, stick the chest out a little bit. Yeah, that's us. And so there was a competition. Even among colonies, they would compete against each other to see who looks the best, who is the most powerful, who is the most respected. And that was filtering into the church. One philosopher spoke of the Romans saying this, Romans 
were absurd slaves to fame, who were stupefied by titles and masks. They were enamored. They were just, that's what they wanted to do. This doesn't sound too far off from maybe other cultures that you might know. One commentary said that this was a race to honors and precedence. And it was threatening the community life in the Philippian church. And so Paul's response is to do nothing like that. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. It is calling oneself to empty themselves of jockeying for position and glory. It's extreme language, but it's clear language. It's non-circumstantial language. It's all-inclusive. Vainglory. It's actually one word. Vainglory is conceit without a reason. One way it was defined was a tendency to compete with others for glory and then thus to envy themselves when others had good fortune. Right? If you are competing, you can't be happy for someone else's success because it means your failure. It means someone else has gotten the glory that you might have wanted for yourself. But Paul calls it empty, meaning it has no value. Paul looks at any of those times where we take the glory to ourselves and says, that's not becoming of Christ because it's not right. Both of those two things exhibit a me-first mentality, a me-above-others mentality. And so Paul quickly gives the antidote. The antidote is humility and regarding others better than yourself. If you remember back to when we talked about humility, it was a, a word that really wasn't understood in the, the culture in that day and age. It was not a positive thing at all. It only really started to take on any type of positive feel when the gospel came and talked about humility and it became something other than a sign of weakness. It was really typically just used as weakness, as poverty, as we're unworthy. And the Christians took that and said, hey, we are weak. We are unworthy. We are powerless. We don't deserve glory ourselves. And they spun that to say, and so therefore Christ is worthy. And so we claim humility. Humility enables one to see themselves in a right condition. As a creature of God, and to see others as equally deserving of respect and honor. And so therefore, to consider others better is the call of the Christian not to just maybe put himself down, but to raise others up. You know, it is really hard when, when you hear someone say, consider others better than yourself. Here's what typically I do in my heart. Oh, well, that means I must beat myself down. It's like, here they are, here I think I am, so my job is to just beat myself up. Let me recount all my failures and all my shortcomings, and that will make me feel more miserable about myself, which will elevate them above me. I don't see that as a biblical principle at all, when it says consider others better than yourself. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying beat yourself up, because what you're doing, your focus is where? Still on you, right? And so it ends up being false pride, because at the end of the day, you've gone, well, yeah, 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 I'll beat all those things up. But I know about them, and so therefore I'm taking care of them, and so I'm walking the Lord with them. And so really, I, oh, there I am again. I'm, I'm above them again. The point is to look at others and to value them as people, not as characters in your narrative or your little movie that happen to come into your life for a season because God wanted to bring them in, and then he lets them go back out of your little world but to see them as people with actual stories. I don't know if you've ever done this. Maybe this is just a weird thing that I do. But I'll, I'll be driving down the interstate, and I'll look over, and there's like this construction worker, and he's doing things, right? In my world, all he is is this guy over there that I'm driving by that I don't want to hit. That's goal number one. Don't hit the man working on the side of the road, right? But have you ever just stopped to think, hey, guess what I am for him? I'm just a car he's trying to avoid being hit by. He's got his own narrative and his own story. He's got his own life that he's dealing with, his own struggles, 
his own finances and decisions that he's having to make, maybe decisions and things that are going on with his family and his wife. You see, it's elevating that person to think, hey, they have existence. They have worth. It's going to a door and knocking on the door, not to check a box. We were talking about that in the Smith's class this morning. Not to check a box that I have I've gone and done the good deed by fulfilling the great commission by checking a box. It's actually because I knock on the door because I elevate the other person on the other side because they're made in the image of God and I desire to share the gospel of that same love that I have experienced with them. It's our attention put elsewhere. It's not us falsely subjecting ourselves to one another. It's lifting up the others and their stories so that we can serve and love one another. That's why he says, do not, in the, my text it adds merely, because it's trying to com- help communicate what he is talking about. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. It is not the exclusion. We, we have lives and we have to fulfill them. We have obligations and we have to do them. But it's don't merely put yourself at the center of your universe. But it's look to others around you. It is look out for others, the interests of them. One commentary, I, I love this thought. It says Paul's ideal here makes it unnecessary for individuals to be consumed by their own concerns because someone else in the fellowship should be concerned about them as well. You ever been that where if you don't care, no one else will care, and you're the only one, and you're the Savior, and you got to fix it all? What the illustration he's saying here is, hey, you're taking care of your things, but you're looking out for others, and guess what? Others are doing the same thing back for you, and you're doing this together in community. It says it may seem too idealistic to expect this kind of behavior in a church of gathered sinners who remain imperfect, but Paul does not describe them as such. He does not describe them as church members, but as those who are united in Christ. You see, he's called them by their identity and by that which has bound them together in their unity. That is Christ. Christ is the centerpiece of it all. This is the picture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he's writing, and he's talking about people going to take each other to courts, even if in the body of Christ. He's like, what in the world are we doing? And he says this words at the, these words at the end in verse 7. He says, why not just rather be wrong? Why not just rather be defrauded? Man, I think about that. I think about that all a lot. Are we willing to just be wrong? Not to be vindicated. Because I want to show you an example, Paul says. You go to verse 5, and he starts painting a picture. Not of himself anymore, but of the example par excellent. Here's the point I want you to get from that. Your sacrifice for unity and purpose will never eclipse your Savior's example. Your sacrifice for unity and purpose is never going to eclipse your Savior's example. Jesus is the model. The Philippian church is not challenged nor called to do something more than their writer, the writer of the letter, nor their Savior was willing to do. Paul had given them his example in chapter 1, preaching the gospel, Even in pretense, he was excited that Jesus was being made known. He was living out that example and demonstrating what we focus on. But now he gives us Jesus. And he says, have this attitude which is also in Christ. It is also in Christ. The attitude that you are to have. What is that attitude? I I go back to the King James Version on this one because I love it. I've mentioned this before. I love this, the way that the KJV communicates it. Look at verse 6. It's... The way the KGB says it is, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I love the way that the KJB puts it here because I think of the fact that this Jesus that we have as an example had every right to claim every bit of allegiance, glory, power, preeminence, prerogative that he would want. 
It wasn't robbery to do so. This was not taking something that did not belong to him. Instead, what he did was he laid that down. He chose not to. As God, as the second person of the Trinity, he was and is worthy of all of them, but he sets them aside to bring peace and unity between God and man. And we have this beautiful picture here. And so this is the the picture that Paul is painting for us. You may be so right in your estimation and in your stance But the question is, are you willing to relinquish the demand for its acknowledgement and your vindication so as to bring peace and unity by considering others just as important as you are? Man, that's tough. Because I like to be right. And I like to have others understand that I'm right. And then agree that I'm right. And then live in my rightness. And the reality is most of us are that way. Because if we weren't right, we would change. And so we think we're right on everything. And so it becomes hard. And so Christian, here is your example. Here is your Savior. And the question that confronts every one of us, and it confronts these members of this church, are you willing to strip yourself of personal validation, even allowing all your rights to be counted among apparent wrongs for the sake of the body? One commentary said this, equality with God in the Roman culture would have been widely assumed to mean privilege, power, and glory, as evidenced by the behaviors of the gods and the goddesses of the Greek mythology who could do whatever they want. And so here's the question for us. Do we as Christians reflect more Jesus or the gods of Greek mythology when it comes to living out our lives in the community of faith? Do we exercise our prerogative or do we surrender those things for the common good? Are we justified to do as we please making ourselves akin to the very Greek gods that Paul is writing against? Or are we, like our Savior, relinquishing our prerogatives and willing to seek a shared unity in the faith family? Notice what it says, Jesus instead emptied himself. This is the opposite of that vain glory that was empty glory. He emptied himself. Vain glory is claiming something that you don't have may or is of no consequence. Emptying has the understanding that there is validation, but yet you have poured it out. So being conceited is trying to fill up something you don't have, and emptying is letting what you have and you know to be yours laid down for a greater cause. This is what Christ does. Christ has the right to do as he chooses. He has the right to choose and to take on all the glory, and yet it says that he takes on a faithful servant's role. He takes on humanity's form. He takes on sin's curse of death, and he chooses to humble himself. Notice the wording there. He humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. It was an active surrender. It was not done to him, It was something he chose. Can I tell you some of the times that we are most humbled are times when it has to be brought upon us rather than we surrender it over. Sometimes it's a whole lot thicker up here that it requires the Lord to work on us so that he breaks us of our pride rather than through his spirit and through our desire for the spirit to live his life through us, that we would submit ourselves to him. You see, if you always have to be right, if you always have to have the last word, if you always have to defend yourself, if you always have to be vindicated, justified, proved right, ascribed significant, acknowledged in your valued opinion, then I think what Paul is saying to us here is we may need to revisit who our Savior is and what our model really did. 
You see, it's a level of trust. And that's where it brings me to this last part. In God's economy, honor and blessing are never diminished by sacrifice. They are instead enhanced by it. Now, man, that's hard to put your faith and trust in. But, man, that's exactly what he's showing here in Jesus. Hear it. Honor and blessing are never diminished by sacrifice. In God's economy, instead, they are enhanced by it. Look what he says in verse 9. He says, for this reason, because my son has done this, as a result of him becoming human, of surrendering himself in human form to death, even death on the cross, for this reason, God highly exalts him because of Jesus' willingness to set aside his rights, his willingness to sacrifice, his willingness to be a faithful servant, a bond servant. Exactly what Paul identifies himself as at the beginning of the book. Through the cross, notice what is the point here, is the sacrifice of personal prerogative and rights. Notice the resurrection is not in this passage. It's pointing to a different lesson. He'll get to the resurrection over in chapter 3, and he'll talk about it. But right now, the point is, if you're going to live in the context of community, look at the example, the one who gave his very life. This is the illustration that he's pointing to in the life of Christ. It is his model in death that's in view here. Jesus endures the cross, and because of that, God responds with honor and vindication for Jesus. It's in God's timeline, in the way that God does things. But Jesus entrusted himself to his heavenly Father and obeys. And because of this, he gets a name above every name. Roman fame? No, outdone. Every knee, everywhere will bow. Roman homage? No. Universal reverence. Every tongue would confess not just his human dignity, but his divinity and his lordship. It would be praise and worship. This was God's perfectly executed plan through a willing servant, Jesus, our Savior. Paul says, joy, these things are good. My letter, I'm writing to you, and I want you to have joy. And look at Jesus, who's the centerpiece of how all of this is possible. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it means it's worth it. It's a call to trust God to take care of all the details. And not for us to have to defend ourselves. It's a call for us to trust God to vindicate what is worth vindicating. But can I just say a side note real quick, and that is this. In the context of the passage, we've looked at it from the idea of unity and the call to this example. But I want you to notice something about Jesus. Verse 10 and 11 really clear up some things for us. You see, Jesus truly is Lord. And it is regardless of opinion. God is God and Jesus is Lord. You get this picture very clearly. Whether you want to surrender to this unity idea or not, whether you want to take this Christianity thing or not, it doesn't actually change the objective truth. That the Savior who's given his life as a sacrifice and a model for you Regardless of what you do with him, it does not change the fact that he is the second person of the Trinity. He's the risen Lord, that one day he will come back and every person will acknowledge it. Like that's the reality of who this Jesus is. And it's the call that Paul allows him to see, but he puts in this beautiful picture of unity. But the implication that is still very powerful it doesn't matter what you think. That's why we can submit ourselves and we can entrust ourselves to God. It doesn't matter what you think. 
the end of the day, Jesus is God. At the end of the day, Jesus is the Savior of the world. At the end of the day, you will confess Jesus is Lord. You will either do that as his child, having received abundant grace, or you will do it as someone who made in his image choose to reject him. But it does not diminish who he is because you and I don't get to define him. We try to define so many things in church in the way we think everything should be. And that's the whole point. It's that Paul says, for unity's sake, do what Jesus did. Jesus, I'm God. Take on human form. I'm God. Die. I'm God. Take on sin. Notice how Paul ends it. That every time we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. This morning as we were talking and getting ready to pray, the wise sage Rusty said, how does my attitude reflect the glory of God? When I think about this, and I think about unity in the body, the way that you're perceiving this, the way that you're holding on to your opinions and your prerogatives, your preferences, does it align with the story and the life of your Savior to bring glory to God? That's a real big question. That's a question every one of us every day must answer. The way that we live out our life through our adversities, our challenges, our successes, are they lived to the glory of God? The way that we fight for one another and for unity, the way we lay ourselves down and sacrifice because we know there's something greater, is it to the the glory of God? Can you say, that the way that you're living is to the glory of the one who made you and who remakes you in Christ. This is the example set before us. There is no greater example than our Savior. And the beauty is that he changes us. And so it's not us trying to do it. But it's the affections and the consolation and the encouragement that are found in Christ, in his spirit. And so let's, let's surrender and say your work and your ways are worth laying down our lives. If you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to understand something. That's what you did when you came to Christ. You surrendered. And now every day afterwards, it's a call just to be reminded to continue. Because as powerfully as he showed up at that day of salvation, he can continue to show up every day afterwards. And he can let the world know that he is the Savior through this, through his people the body of Christ. Make my joy complete. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for that truth. That truth that because of who Christ is, there is one who is worthy for us to surrender ourselves, to look across this room to understand that we have different shades of brown, we have different bank accounts in our, or balances in our bank accounts. We have different even political views. We have different views on how things should be handled. 
whether they are related to a pandemic or whether they are related to an order of service. And yet, you have called us to confound the world by loving one another with such integrity and passion, with such compassion and grace that we would count others of greater value because we are willing to lay ourselves down for the good of them and of this body. I thank you for the reminder that this is never a new thing, that this is something that we as humanity have faced ever since the garden. And yet I thank you also that because of Christ, not only do we have an example, but we have the power to show the world that unity is possible, that it is found in following a Savior, even if it means that we die to self completely. May that be our prayer to your glory and to our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you back this afternoon for our fall family night. Make sure you sign up for fall retreat. Let me pray as we leave. Father, I thank you for today and for the chance we've had to come in to even spend time lifting our voices together, demonstrating a unity that your people might be known by their love for one another, by their willingness to serve and to put one another above even their own desires. So that the gospel would be on display that the power of the grace of God would be on display. So help us to go out today, whether that's this afternoon at a fall family night or throughout this week, living out a life that is in surrender so that you might be known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.